Jane, thank you so much for joining. And thank you for much so much for inviting me. Um, so I have a lot of African-American friends who have been saying, don't burden us by making us explain their racist, you know, their experience of racism that is ongoing uh, to us right now. Elevate our their voices, but we need we need to all we white folks like me need to take responsibility for waking up. And you've been doing that work for a couple years now. Fifty-two. Fifty-two. Um, so older than you are. Yep. Yep. Barely. I'm getting old fast. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you're old. I'm 86 and you're old. Yeah, well, I have to say, watching your videos, I fell madly in love with you. You are exactly what this moment needs, along with so many other uh, educators, many of whom are, of course, uh, are uh, black and brown brothers and sisters. So thank you for joining us. And I want to invite you and in indeed supplicate you to be as hard on me or an, as tough on any of us as you like. We need to all wake up. And we do have many um, wonderful writers and readers in our community who are of color. And we encourage all of you to speak up and they ask a question. Uh, and we will relay your questions to Jane. I will. Um, Jane, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And let's yeah. get on with it. Let's do it. <laughs> so I don't know what it is. You can't exactly do your infamous or famous uh, well, well, let me let me start. Let me show you what it is. Thank you. We judge people by our own ignorance and by our own experiential background. And right now, you need to know that my husband died six and a half years ago, and he had a lovely hairy chest. And I'm looking at your lovely hairy chest and wishing to God you would button that up a little. Done. Now, you see, that's one of the things we don't ever think about is how our behaviors, our dress, our language affect other people. And we teach the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. In other words, treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, I know very well that you as a young pale faced male do not want to be treated the way I as an old pale faced woman want to be treated. I don't have the right to treat you the way I want to be treated. I have to live by the platinum rule, which says, do unto others as others would have you do unto them. Treat others not the way you want to be treated, but the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And in order to find out how they want to be treated, you have to ask them, you have to listen to the answer, and that's a new experience for pale faces. You have to listen to the answer, and if what they ask you to do is an indecent, illegal, or immoral, you have to do it. But that the platinum rule means you have to communicate with other people on their grounds instead of your own. I am extremely upset by people who say, I treat everybody the way I want to be treated. And in the next sentence, they'll say to me, well, I don't dislike black people, but I wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. And I say, wait a minute, fool. Number one, are you, are you telling me? And when you keep saying white, white with your white, you are not white and neither am I. I see the color of my shirt. What color is my shirt? It's white. Okay, then what, can you see where my shirt stops and my skin begins? Yes. Is my skin white? No. No, and it never has been and it never will be. There are no, practically, no white people on this earth. Every person on this earth, their bodies produce melanin in re response to the ways, the, to their, where they live, what they eat, and how much sunlight you get, they get. So this business of black and white is black is evil, white is pure. This is ridiculous. It has only been going on for 500 years. We created, human beings created racism. God, in my estimation, created one race, the human race. Human beings created racism. Anything you create, you can destroy. We could destroy racism in this country in two generations if we decided to. Look here, it only took us three years to get to the moon after John F. Kennedy got, uh, got elected. It has only taken us four, almost four years to take drastic steps backward this, since this person who lives in the president's residence has been in that area. Yeah. We could go, we, are, we have gone backward farther in four, almost four years than we went forward in all the preceding years. 
You have to realize that. Just a minute. I'm on the, I'm doing an iPad. You'll have to talk to me. Right Jane, now. it's uh, being very generous. You've been on three interviews already today. Thank you for your time. I know you're getting a lot of calls. That's all right. Did you hear what I just said to you? We did. I did. Okay. It doesn't matter that I've been on three things already this morning. What no. matters is I will do these as often as I can find even one person who is willing to listen and to learn. And the mm. thing you have to know is there is only one race of people on the face of the earth, and that is human beings. We are right. all members of the whole, we are all homo sapiens, and homo sapiens come in different sizes, shapes, genders, gender orientations, colors, religion, ethnicities, but we are all members of the same race. I want to stop the myth of race because it isn't a myth. A myth mm. is something you make up to explain physical phenomena, phys and natural phenomena. Lies are what you make up to justify your ignorant behaviors. The myth of race is actually the lie of race, and we made it up about 500 years ago to justify killing people of different color groups in order to make them Christian. And mm. that's what we did when we came to this country. The minute we set foot, we so-called white people, set foot on this land, we started killing the natural inhabitants. And we knew who, which ones to kill because we killed red men, and they weren't red we were ignorant in that area too because they were red only because of the color of their skin. They weren't even red. This is ridiculous. I'm doing a podcast. Call me back. Goodbye. So Jane, let me ask a clarifying question. When you say we're all of one race, you're not, we are. yeah, you're not saying I don't see color. Oh God, no, oh, no, 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 no. Let me make that perfectly clear. People say to me all the time, I don't see color. It's always a liberal pale faced female who comes up to me and says during a meeting, I don't see color, I'm colorblind. And I say, I knew that before you said it because if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. Right. And then she gets offended because right. that's a terrible thing to say to her, but it's all right. right for her to say that she doesn't see the largest organ on another person's body. And your skin inch for inch is the largest organ on your body for somebody to say they don't see it is to admit that they, they have trouble communicating with someone of a different color group so they just have to pretend that they don't see that unfortunate discoloration yeah. i want that sentence taken out of your lexicon don't ever ever say to me when i see people i don't see people as black or brown or red or yellow i just see people as people they never put the word white in that sentence because mm -hmm. it's all right to see white yeah, you do an exercise where you invite folks uh, in an audience to stand up if they would like the... Yes. I'll let you finish that. I, I, I ask people, uh, the last one I did like that, I was on the stage with this marvelous black woman. And I said to this group at the University of Houston, because somebody had said, well, if they, if they, somebody out of the audience said, if they get power, aren't they going, they want, going to want to treat us the way we have treated them? Aren't they going to want to get even with us? I said, well, let's find out. Well, every black person who's, every person in this room who considers himself black, who wants to get even with all white folks, please stand. Three young black males stood up and the rest of them looked at him like, well, how crazy are you, fool? I, mm -hmm. And the white folks were so, they were so relieved. And they were just, you know, they just relaxed right now. And Angela Davis looked at me like, where are you going with this one? I said, well, now that's nice, isn't it? Now, but let's be honest about this. Well, every black person in this room who wants to get even with one or two white people, please stand up. They all leaped to their feet, yelling and cheering and clapping and high-fiving one another. And white folks then got tense again. I said, see people, they don't want to get even with all of us. Each one of them wants to get even with one or two of us. Now, if you want to be treated fairly in the future, treat people of other color groups fairly in the present. Behave in such a way that you won't be one of the one or two they want to get even with. And everybody, and I said, does that make sense to you? And all the students of color cheered and applauded and the white students looked like, oh shit. And I know what they were thinking. Does that mean I have to take that sentence out of my lexicon? Yes. Yes, it does. I don't think people of color want to get even with all of us, other color groups. And by the way, white is a color. It's the absence of all other colors. Black, on the other hand, is the presence of all colors. You put all colors together and you will get black. And mm. that's what we are. We are all members of the same race that evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And those people were black. 
and mm. they were so brilliant and so creative and so remarkable that they left the area of the equator and over thousands of years managed to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Every person watching this now, right now, if you trace your DNA back far enough, you'll find a percentage of your DNA came from a country in Africa. Get over it. We are all members of the same race. You aren't my brother. You are one of my 30th to 50th cousins. Mm. If you were my brother, you would be dead. All my brothers, my brothers, practically, with the, with the exception of two. Anyway, you need to realize that we are all 30th to 50th, 50th cousins. That's a fact, and it's time to get over the myth, no, the lie of race. Right. Now, what am I, the managing editor, one of the two at Elephant, Nicole, uh, wrote a letter. She's a person of color, and she wrote uh, an article on Elephant saying she wants her white friends, her white would-be allies, to be willing to sit in the yuck, to be uncomfortable. And I think that's partially what why you're in such demand right now. You make people uncomfortable with a sense of love and with fear and with consistence. No, wait, How wait, wait, we... wait, do, wait, wait, wait. Do not accuse me of using love. Okay. We have misused the word love to the point where it doesn't have any meaning anymore. I okay. love brownie pudding. I absolutely sure. love it, especially with ice cream on top of it. So yeah. here's a really, really dark dessert with a really, really light ice cream on top of it. I love that. But mm. I don't feel the same way about other people as I do about brownie pudding and ice cream. Okay. I want us to stop using the word love in that context. I appreciate, I recognize, I value people as they are, not as they act or look more like me. Right. You don't have to look like me for me to appreciate, recognize, and value you. Thank you. My so how can we... Well, I guess my question is, and thank you for that. My question is, how can we be willing to be uncomfortable and actually learn and stop the cyclical generational ignorance? Uh, your quote, I think you have a couple sweatshirts I've seen, but one of them says, prejudice is uh, an emotional attachment, if I remember, to ignorance. Prejudice as an emotional commitment to ignorance. So but how can we... Can you please kick us in the rear and help us give up our attachment to ignorance because it's more comfortable? Privilege. You're only, com don't, don't, we got to give up privilege. Okay. Because yeah. that paper was written about white privilege. Number one, there are no white people. And number two, the reason pale faces have the power that we have is because of ignorance. And because we educate, we don't educate, we train people to believe in the brightness of whiteness. Mm -hmm. That is the result of bad, bad learning. What we yeah. have to do is self-educate. And the way you self-educate is, here's one of the ways you self-educate yourself and your children. See this map? Yes. Get a picture in your man, mind of the map that you saw when you were in school and that you would see if you were in school now. Can you right. see Greenland hanging down in the middle of that map like a great big ripe plum? Yes. If you look careful at that, carefully at that map, if you read the legend at the bottom of that map, it says South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Yeah. Now get a picture of that map again. Is South America nine times no. larger than Greenland? And not in no. fact it isn't, but according to that map, it is. And Emily, is the map. I'm sorry, go ahead. Emily Molly, our editors who are, are helping out, we have an article on that showing the different maps and the actual sizes the accurate sizes is called, do you remember the name of the correct map that shows? Oh, the Peter's the projection map, and here it is. Yes, exactly, yes. thank you. Yes, but you have There's to know that. that. Can, can you, do you have a picture of the regular, the Mercator map? Is there one there in the studio? Yeah, the, the blog we have has both of them in it, so we're gonna put that link in the sidebar. Just look up Peter's projection map, Emily or Molly. Thank you but for that. Put up, can, put up the Mercator projection map too, so that people can see the difference. Yeah. Because this is a map that is fair to all people. The, there it is. Jane, the, the link is in the sidebar. The world isn't even close to what you think it looks like. That's the name of the blog. Okay. The, 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 the areas on the, the land areas on this map are distorted. The shapes are distorted, but the sizes are right. Right. On this map, South America is nine times larger than Greenland. 
Look at the size of Africa on this map. It stretches forever. But look at the size of Canada on the Mercator wow. projection map. It stretches right. from hell to breakfast, and it's wrong. Canada is only this big. You have to realize that we have been, this is called the miseducation of the American mind. Yeah. The, the Mercator map is. We yeah. need to stop using the Mercator map. Okay. We need to know the history of that map. The Mercator map was drawn by a man who was commissioned by the Pope to make a map that showed the spread of Christianity. And mm -hmm. so on the Mercator map, the countries that have mostly people of other colors other than white on it, uh, those countries are larger. The countries south of what is called the equator are smaller because they are countries without lots of people with no color. Now mm -hmm. you look at the, the equator on the Mercator projection map and you'll find that it's two thirds of the way down the map. So you can't use the Mercator map if you're going to treat, teach Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere because hemi is a prefix that means half. Hmm. The, per, the Mercator projection map doesn't show, doesn't separate the, the, wor the wor world into two equal parts. It separates it into two thirds and one third. So right. you can either give up hemi Quit calling them hemisphere or agree that you are miseducating the American mind. You are cre creating cognitive dissonance in children from the time they enter kindergarten. You hand a kid a box of crayons yeah. and you say, this is the white crayon. And every kid will put that against their skin because obviously they're white and you have them put that crayon against your skin. Now, is your skin white, Sonny? Right. And they're all going to say, no. Then you yeah. say, from now on, we aren't going to refer to people as white and black. We're going to refer to people at people at, by their color group. Yes, right. but not white because there are no white people. We mm -hmm. are all shades of brown, very, very light brown or very, very dark brown. And we need to realize that. Thank you. Now, now there are a whole lot of black people who are going to say, I want to give up being called black. Fine, but I want to give up being called white. I'll mm -hmm. call you whatever you want me to as long as you don't want me to be called white, and as long as a white person doesn't expect me to refer to that person as white. We are all shades of brown. And in the Bible, which we all profess to believe in, it says that Jesus had kinky woolly hair and feet of bronze. Mm. Now, we white folks, so-called white folks, have changed Jesus into someone we can relate to. Right. And we turn Jesus into a pale-skinned man yep. with indeterminate eye color because we don't want to admit we, that we all came from and were taught a religion we came from people who were very very dark skin and we were taught our religion we learned religion about a man who had bronze feet and woolly hair yeah we uh turned him into looking like he was irish or something like red hair and blue eyes or green eyes no 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 he doesn't look irish because you mm. <laughs> we won't wait hey Homo sapiens, once Homo sapiens appeared on the earth, all of Java man, all of Peking man, and all of Neanderthal man practically disappeared from the earth. You can always tell a Neanderthal, there are several, lots of us, all of us have some Neanderthal in us, but you can tell those who have a lot more Neanderthal, they are, they have, they are inclined to abdominal fat, they are bullish and bullying, and they have orange hair. Hmm. Now, do you know anyone who looks like that? Does a picture of someone come to your mind? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one okay, one person okay. in particular right now. Okay, <laughs> which yeah. may be which may be the reason he behaves the way he does because he is more Neanderthal than he is Homo sapien. Right. And if that's the way it is, then there's nothing you can do about it except try to educate him. Right. I'm. You know, these people who uh, believe in the lie of racism and race aren't stupid. You can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorant, and you fix ignorant with education. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. That's mm. what education ought to do. And if it had been doing that all these years, we wouldn't have a racism problem in this country because we wouldn't have any racists. We would see we would be seeing everybody as our 30th to 50th cousin and deserving of every right that light-skinned people have. And that's why you say two generations, that if all of us taught our children uh, that we're all equal, that we all... No, 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 no. I didn't say we're all equal. 
I'm not okay. equal to you and I never will be. I'll never okay. be as young as you are. I'll never be as tall as you are. I'll never know what you want, know, know about doing your job. I'll never know what you know about being a male. Okay. We are all guaranteed equitable treatment, equal treatment under the law, but we are not all equal. We are equal only in the eyes of God. I guess you that's I what I mean by equal. Let me clarify. I guess that's what, and please change my mind, but that we're fundamentally decent, good human beings deserving of equal rights. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are we yeah. fundamentally good human beings? A whole lot of people will not see us who are the major killers of the world, have been in order to get where we are, yeah. in order to maintain our power. That isn't being good. That's being no. powerful. But it doesn't necessarily That's why I mean think good. I, no, I think no, just I, from I, the first... Sorry. No, I can't, yeah. um, I, you can judge person by... My, my father would say every week, a man is judged by the company he keeps and the best of companies and I'm too good. Now think about that. And yeah. I look at I look at the man who's in the president's residence and the kind of company he keeps. That's scary. We judge people by the way they behave. We don't automatically assume that everyone is good. He may they may be good in yeah. the eyes of God, but they may no. not be good for the community, Agreed. for their family for the state or for the country. I guess that's what I mean in the eyes of God. I come from the Buddhist tradition. My parents were hippies. My mom was a teacher and she taught the uh, Peter's projection map in her school. Um, if I so, could turn this off, I would. Please, just, just put the basic goodness in the, in the side part and it's, I think we're on the same page. God, God views us as good, but our actions are often selfish and confused and um, Ignorant. kind of myopic. Yeah, but the, or the word that your mother, I'm sure, was thinking of is ignorant. We aren't yeah. stupid, we're ignorant. And you cure ignorance with education, which is what your mother did for you, which is what Buddhists do for all of us if we would just listen to them. But, mm. but Christianity is very different from other religions in many, many ways. We, we're, a, we're a different breed, breed of cat, there's no doubt about it. And mm. I'm, a, I'm a Christian, a practicing Christian. I'm going to keep on practicing till I get it right. I don't have right. it right yet. I'm working on it. Right. Well, thank you for that. So um, there seem to be many illusions or confusions that I have. And I I was raised properly by my mom to um, hopefully not be racist. But we all have we all have assumed racism, right? Not just overt racism, but uh, assumptions that what what can we let go of or what can we see in ourselves that we don't want to? How can we, how we wake up more? We need to assume that most of what we learned in social studies class was wrong. Mm. Because right. in social studies class, starting in kindergarten, you learn about the rightness of whiteness. You learn right. about the fact that we are quite certain that white men did all the discovering, all the inventing, all the, they did it all. No white women had anything to do with it, except maybe three or four. But on right. the, for the most part, you learned about the goodness and the brilliance of white people. Well, Columbus Day is one of the most blatant examples of that. We think we discovered, we white people think we discovered an entire continent. Yeah, yeah, well, well, but Thor Heyerdahl told us, you, right. Columbus didn't discover America. You can't discover the place where people are already living. They discovered it before you got there. Exactly. We, are, we do not want to give up the myth of the greatness of Christopher Columbus. He captured uh, several members of the Arawak tribe, which is what he found when he came to these this, um, to the two where he came to, and he took them back and showed them to the Pope, and the Pope said these creatures aren't Christian, so they must they must not be human. They mm. kept them in that land and Christianized them and took them back and showed them to the Pope three or four years later, and he said, oh, these creatures have become Christianized, therefore they must be human, and he granted human status to the mm. Arawak people because he said they're human. Now, I happen to think they were human before the Pope said so. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think the Japanese were human before we bombed Pearl Harbor with two mm -hmm. atomic bombs. And I happen to think the Germans were human, but they didn't kill, we did, they killed 10 million people during the Second World War. We didn't drop an atomic bomb on them. Right. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan because right. at that time we had been led to believe that they are, and I remember the vocabulary because I was eight years old when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. We called them the most ridiculous, 
ugly, discriminating, destructive ways, that, words that you could possibly say. And it's only been in the last few years that we realized that we were lied to there too. Yes, they bombed Pearl Harbor, but we forgot about the history before that. Yeah, and we intern them here in, in our own camps. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're now, we're, if you think, you see what, what's happening right now is very reminiscent for me of what happened during pre-Second World War. The way this man is talking, it's the way the Hitler talked. It, it's exactly the kinds of use, the kinds of language and the kinds of principles that he has came right out of the writings of Adolf Hitler. And if you don't believe that, then you need to get the book when at times the mob is swayed by Bert Newborn. Everybody mm -hmm. needs to read that book because it tells in that book that his second wife, his, yeah, his second wife said that he has in his bedside table a locked drawer in which he has a book that contains the writings of Adolf Hitler. Now, when I have thought about, oh my God, this is Hitlerian for the last three and a half years, I didn't realize that I was seeing what was really happening until I read that book. You need to realize that we are being led by a person who believes in a dictatorship and he would like to be the dictator. You yep. have to understand that. Now, I yep. know if, look people, don't sell, send me angry letters saying I'm right, wrong about that. Read the book and look yep. at history. And remember that I remember because it happened when I was born. The, the book, was born the same year the book is When at Times the Mob is Swayed. When at Times the Mob, M-O-B, is Swayed. S-W-A-Y-E-D. You need and to read that. that I was so, born the same year that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt came to power. I saw all these things happen. I watched my father just agonize over what was going on. And then came the Second World War. And we were taught to hate Japanese people because they attacked Pearl Harbor. <laughs> yeah. They attacked Pearl Harbor in retaliation for what we had done to their country for years. Yeah. On the other hand, Germany killed 10 million people. We didn't drop bombs on them. They look like us. I want to ask uh, folks, particularly now um, when Amazon is making billions of dollars to support your local independent and possibly black owned books, bookshops, please take that Amazon link out. I know it's well intentioned. Goodreads um, may have been bought by Amazon too. Let's support our local communities and particularly people of color uh, bookshops, if you can, please. Um, it, isn't just, it, isn't just, it isn't just bookshops. Amazon no. is destroying mom and pop businesses all over the United States of America yeah. because they have the power to do it and they have the permission to do it. And what we have is a monopoly there and monopolies are against the law. But they yeah. aren't against the law as long as the members of the business roundtable, who are cohorts of our so-called president, continue to do the kinds of things that Amazon is doing. We have to break up these people who are monopolizing what you yeah. can buy, what you can sell, what you can read, what you can think, what you can hear, and what you can watch on television. Now, I have so, no problem with people making money as long as they are will allow others to make money too. Amen. So a lot of people want to buy that. Uh, a lot of people want to buy that book right now. Let's get a Powell's link. Powell's is a wonderful independent. There's also Abe books. Let's put those links in there. And Emily and Molly, please watch. I know you're looking for links, but some people have been asking about um, Jane's work. Let's put the link to her work in here. Yeah. Oh, another get, book. Get this book, The Color of Law. And okay. read, if you don't read the whole thing, just read, there are two pages in here that everybody has to read. I don't remember what they are right now, but this book will tell you the, the, law, the laws we have in this country that cause, that cause segregation are the result of people who had never heard of the fact that there's more than one race. Mm. Laws in this country have been written by people who were indoctrinated with the lie of race. And so we make laws, lawyers make laws, laws out of what they know. Teachers yep. teach subjects out of what they know. Yep. They don't know any better and you can't right. teach what you don't know. You read this book and you will realize how many of our laws are deliberately constructed to, come to, to protect and promote the status quo. 
they are they uh, we have segregation in cities and people say it's de facto segregation those people just want to live with people who are like themselves no we have de jure segregation which is caused by the people who write the laws that force you to be segregated yeah if you don't know that you need to read this book people if well, you want to solve the problem of racism you self-educate you cannot yeah. expect your teachers your preachers your ministers your priests your rabbis even even your buddhist leaders you can't expect them to educate you you can expect them to indoctrinate you into their beliefs mm -hmm. it's time for us to self-educate you read this and then a quick and easy way to get an education a really easy way whoopsie there goes my telephone well the, the battery fell out so i don't have to worry about that get we have you all day <laughs> get this magazine Okay. National Geographic for April of 2018, 2018. Okay. Get this magazine and read it. It will blow you away. These two girls are twins. These are twin girls. Wow. Both humans. Both their parents yeah. had human parents. Neither of their parents came from outer space. Get this magazine and then turn to this page. Where is this page? Just a minute now. Uh, it's, I'm going to get there. This is a map of the world which shows where people started and how they moved from there to mm. populate land masses all over the world without wow. the benefit of any modern technology. Those black people did that. And, and as they got farther and farther from the equator, their bodies were in response to the natural environment. They changed shape and color, but they didn't change their level of intelligence. They were able to do that without any what we call so-called white people telling them how to do it. I right. want to know how you justify calling. And yesterday and day before yesterday, the day before that, I watched all these lovely people on television describing what was happening in all these cities. And they're saying all these multiracial groups. I want to shake the television because those are not multiracial groups. Mm. They are groups of multicolors, many colors, many ethnicities, many religions, maybe many genders many gender orientations, but they are not groups of many races. They're all human beings, one race, homo sapiens. Thank you. In anger, because we have been taught to believe that there are several different races and the white race is the best. It's absolutely un-American. It's unintelligent. It's, you can't do it. You have, we have to put a stop to this. And we are in you know, this, we, we better put a stop to it soon because the demographics of this country say that by within 30 years, within 30 years, white people will have become a numerical minority on mm -hmm. this land, on, in the world, but certainly in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why white males are so upset right now. Exactly. They know, yeah, oh yeah, they know that as that white woman said, aren't they gonna wanna treat us the way we've treated them? Yet if you're worried about the way you're gonna be treated in the future, by people of color, treat them fairly in the present and realize that you are one of them. If you're a human being on the face of the earth, you are a member of the race that was started between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And it wasn't the white race because we couldn't have survived. White people couldn't have survived in Africa at that time no. without clothing and without housing. But they did because they were brilliant and they still are but we yeah. don't realize it because we have been taught to think of them as less than. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. The alcoholics say insanity means doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what we've been doing in this country for 500, 300 years for sure. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. You can't do it. You have to change your behaviors because you won't change the situation until you change your behaviors. Amen. So yeah, a I was women. you gotta stop saying amen and say a women. A women, you got it. <laughs> I know I'm gonna I'm gonna get really nasty comments on that. And do I care? No. Oh yeah, what's your question? No, it's about time uh, mediocre white men like myself listen for a change. Well, I'm not sure you're I'm a not... mediocre, and oh, I know you. you're not white. Right. Exactly. Thank you're you. An average. You're an average light skinned male. But you're Thank not you. a mediocre white man. Thank you. That makes sense to you? Yes. Thank you. And, and you need to remember that in order, order, male is what we call men. In order to make a word that talks about women, we added the chemical symbol for iron 
to the word male to get female. Fe is the chemical symbol for iron. So you add iron to that other group and you got something new and different. And it's strong. You. And strong because we yeah. will outlive you. Most of the men watching this will die 20 or more years before their wives will. And I know that because mine did and I'm really angry. <laughs> anyway, okay, now I turn into a soup sandwich. No, go, what's your next question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess my next question is what I was watching this video by Martin Luther King Jr. talking about riots as the language of the unheard. And on some level, these protests feel wonderful. They feel like needed and we need we need to wake up. And otherwise, we're just going to, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about what we're going through now, like 60 years ago. And uh, we have to stop, you know. Frederick Douglass talked about it before Martin Luther King Jr. did. Frederick right. Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Right. Find out what any people will quietly submit to, and you will have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. Those yeah. who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Exactly. But what those people did this week, you could have learned, you couldn't have expected if you would study what Frederick Douglass said. And that was a long time before Martin Luther King Jr. Well, according to our president, uh, Frederick Douglass is, is alive. You remember that? Quote? <laughs> yes, he said he's yeah. talking Frederick Douglass. It's like when he went to Puerto Rico and he said, uh, he called Puerto, the person in Puerto Rico and he said, I've talked to your president. And she said, uh, Mr. Trump, you are our president. Right. Whew. Not in his view. We are, we are talking about ignorance here. Ignorance at the highest level. Our commander in chief, ignorant in the extreme and we need to realize that and not allow that to continue for four more years. We must not allow this to happen. Jane, in our remaining minutes, can you tell us a little bit about that time with Martin Luther King Jr.? I know you loved him and how your work started with your students. Yeah, I will, but I don't want to because every time I think about that, I, I do turn into a soup sandwich because that was, a, I watched my little sister die when I was 10 and she was three. And I watched my father mourn that, and I thought that was the worst thing that could happen to me. Right. And then Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And he had, for me, he represented hope. And for me, hope is an acronym for hanging, holding on to positive energy. And that's what mm. he did. Mm. He was one of our heroes of the month in February in my third grade classroom, along with George Washington, who owned slaves, bought and sold people for money. Mm. Abraham Lincoln, who refused to free the slaves until he absolutely had to. Daniel Boone, who was famous for killing, taking Native American land and use, calling it his own. And Davy Crockett, who was killed as he killed, tried to kill Mexicans as we tried to take over part of their land. Right. And those were our heroes of the month in February, along right. with Martin Luther King Jr. That was racist teaching, but I wouldn't have agreed that it was racist teaching because I swore that I would never act like a racist, but I was because I didn't recognize what a racist looked like. And what a racist right. looked like looks like as somebody who used the Mercator projection map and who teaches that Columbus discovered America. I was, we were studying the Indian unit at that time because kids get real antsy in the springtime and they want to get out of the, uh, get out of the room. So you teach them something and you, you involve them in something that's interesting. And what was interesting was Native Americans. We call them Indians because that's what Christopher, that's what uh, Christopher Columbus called them. Come on, they weren't, right. they weren't we, he, he hadn't reached India. But he didn't, couldn't think of another word. Okay, so we're studying the Indian unit. We were going to put up the teepee that my previous year's third graders had made the next day, and we were going to paint it with Indian symbols chosen by white folks, read Indian poetry written by white folks, sing Indian songs written by white folks, and learn the Sioux Indian prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins, which was taught to the Indians by a white minister, missionary. So I had the teepee under my arm. I, walked into my front door, the telephone was ringing. I entered it, it was my sister. She said, Jane, is the, do you have the television on? No, you better turn it on, why? Because they shot him. And I said, who we shoot this time? 
because we were in a shooting mood. We shot anybody who disagreed with us or who said there's a, a better way. And then she said, Martin Luther King Jr. And for a moment, the world stopped turning for me. That was, that was one of the, that was a ter horrible, terrible disaster because he was trying to make the world, the country, a better place for everybody, not just for black people. I was just sick. And so I turned on the television, I fed the kids, I got them to bed, I washed and dried the TV, I laid it out on the living room floor, I was ironing it, and Walter Cronkite came on and he was talking to three leaders of the black community. And he said to those three black males, when our leader was killed, his widow held us together, who's gonna keep your people in line? In line? And I thought, oh my God, it's us and them. If Walter Cronkite thinks that way, oh my God. So I changed the channel. And there was Dan Rather saying to three leaders of the black community, don't you Negroes think you should feel sympathy for us white people because we can't feel the anger at this killing that you Negroes can. And at that point, I rolled up the teepee, I threw it into the closet. I got my hus husband's supper ready because he worked nights at Oliver, the Oliver tractor plant at that time. And I decided at that point that the next day, not only was I going to teach my children that Sioux Indian prayer, I was going to arrange to have it answered for them because mm -hmm. I was going to do what we do in this society. I to walk a mile in a, the I, quote, I walked a mile. Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. I was going to do what we do in this society. I was going to pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they had absolutely no control. I was going to assign characteristics to them, either positive or negative, depending on that, that particular char physical characteristic. I was going to treat them as though all the negative things and the positive things I was saying about them were absolutely true. I was going to force one group to live down to my expectations of them. I was going to for force the other group, encourage the other group to live up to my expectations of them. And I was going to let them find out how it feels to be treated that way 24 seven in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Right. Where we have liberty and justice for all, right. which we don't. No. I didn't know how this would work. If I had known how it would work, I probably wouldn't have done it. If I had known that my children were going to be beaten spit on, that they were, their belongings were going to be destroyed, that they were going to be mentally and physically abused by their peers, by their teachers, and by the parents of their peers, because they had, well, to this day, for 20% of the people in that community, an N-word lover for a mother. If I had known that was going to happen, I wouldn't have done the exercise. If I had known that no people, no, that my parents would lose their business, they had, a, they had a restaurant in a little hotel that we owned. By the, the day before the I did the exercise, they sold a whole bunch of food. The day after it, they sold none. Wow. People would not eat in the restaurant that was owned by the people who raised the town's only N-word lover. If I had known that no teacher would speak to me for 12 years in that system after I did that exercise, because I had, I made them look at themselves in a new way. If I had known that was going to happen, I probably would have done it sooner because I found out I had a whole lot more time to teach when I was no longer included in their hall conferences and my internal environment was a lot less polluted when I no longer had to listen to the racist, sexist, homophobic, ethnocentric statements, but I didn't know. <laughs> so that night when I went to bed, I said the only prayer I was saying at that time, oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace, oh God. I said it over and over like a mantra. I learned something really valuable from the following weeks and the following years. Be careful what you pray for. Mm -hmm. You might get it. Mm -hmm. And you might find out that was exactly what you did not want. I wanted to be accepted in that community. I wanted my father to understand what I was doing and to support me for it and re reinforce it. I, I wanted my mother to do the same thing. My father did. My mother, after my father died, my father kicked me out of the family and said, don't come over here anymore. Nobody's comfortable when you're around. When you did that blue-eyed, brown-eyed thing, you had ruined our reputation in this community. Well, I felt bad about that for about half an hour. And then I thought, you fool, there are only a thousand people in that community, and only 20% of them are as ignorant as your mother. Get over mm. it. Mm. So that didn't bother me. After that, that didn't bother me anymore. And it made my husband really happy because he didn't have to be around her anymore. So there were, you know, there were some real positives to these negatives. Right. But I went into my classroom the next day. And I separated my students according to the color of their eyes. 
and I was shocked at how quickly they became what I told them they were. I will wow. never forget little brown-eyed Debbie when I said blue-eyed people aren't as smart as brown-eyed people. They aren't as clean as brown-eyed people. They aren't as civilized as brown-eyed people. And little brown-eyed Debbie sitting, and I have blue eyes, little brown-eyed Debbie sitting in the front row looked up at me and said, how come you're the teacher here if you've got them blue eyes? Mm. That quickly, that kid knew how to attack the color of my eyes and the words to use to put me in my place. Mm. I thought what my third graders did that day was absolutely awful, what they did to one another, what the brown-eyed people were willing to do to the blue-eyed people and what the blue-eyed people had to do and had to take it. I thought it was just childish reactions. I went down to the teacher's lounge at noon. I was in, I was feeling really bad. Some horrible things were happening in my classroom. Kids were treating each other in a very, in an absolutely unloving way. And I went into the teacher's lounge. There were about 10 teachers in the teacher's lounge. The other two, the other two third grade teachers were in there. One of them was probably maybe 54 at the time. And the other was over 60. They had been molding young minds for many years. And I told them what was happening in my classroom. When I finished telling them what was happening, the younger of those two teachers said, I don't know how, how you have time for all that extra stuff. It's all I can teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, she hadn't taught reading, writing, and arithmetic yet. She might as well have done the extra stuff. And the other one, over 60 years old, molding young minds for over 30 years. And she said to me, on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I don't know why you're doing that. I thought it was about time somebody shot that son of a bitch. Yeah. No teacher shook her head. No teacher gasped. Nobody said, Helen, do you realize what you just said? Yeah. Every one of those so-called educated educators smiled and nodded because she had expressed their feelings perfectly. And the oldest member, as the oldest member of the group, she had the most right to do so. I went back to my classroom determined that no student of any age will ever leave my presence with those attitudes unchallenged. I may not be able to change your attitude, but I can challenge your attitude. And you have to prove to me that white people are superior, so-called white people are superior to everybody else on the face of the earth. And you can't do it because it isn't true. Right. We've got to realize that we do not talk about the inventions, the creations that people of color have created in this country. And when I pull up to a stoplight in Osage, Iowa, and there I am in my car, a little old white, white, so-called white, little old woman, and I look up at the trucker in his big old semi, and he's because he's in a hurry, he's on schedule. I look up and I smile, and he smiles back, and I know he's thinking, oh, she loves me. No, I'm thinking, if you knew that your behavior was governed right now by a light, a, a tra traffic light that was invented by a black man, you'd run that light. You know huh. he would, and I know he would. Huh. I sit there and I smile at him, and I think, you fool. Huh. If he knew what he puts on his heavy work boots in the morning, that he wouldn't have those if it hadn't been for a black man who invented the last so that you could have cheaply made, quickly made shoes, he'd find something else to wear or he'd come up with an invention of his own, which he won't. Because the things that we need are all there already, most of them because of the contributions made by people of color that we, we refuse to admit. Right, right. Yeah, and we don't teach in school. Um, of course not. Of course not. We have to. We have to support the myth of the rightness of whiteness. So we talk talk only about the wonderful things that white males have provided for us. Now, hopefully, schools aren't doing that anymore. But I don't see evidence that they aren't. Except yesterday, and day before yesterday, and yesterday, the day before that, I saw lots of people of different color groups, and different religions, and different gender orientations and different opinions i saw them in the street absolutely infuriated by mm. what the network seemed to think is a good thing to put on every half hour it's mm. time for us to say on the networks people need to say if you want to see the clip of mr george being killed go google it but we are not showing that on this network anymore because it looks like what we're trying to do is intimidate young black males and their mothers. It looks like what we're trying to say to them is this will this is what will happen to you if you get out of line. Now maybe I know most people don't see it that way. Most people are seeing it as how awful that is and we have to show how awful it is. No. We have to realize that every time you do that you are nailing a coffin in the self respect of people of color, particularly black men and their mothers and fathers in this country. We'd better find a better way. Right, thank you.
Thank you for that. And then, we'll, and then we have a man with orange hair mm. clearing, having the police clear the area so that he can go out in front of a church and hold the Bible upside down to demonstrate his greatness. Right mm. now, there is a picture of Adolf Hitler standing like this, and it is almost an exact replica of what Mr. Trump did yesterday. Let me ask you a question. When you do did this exercise with Debbie and all her classmates, your your dear pupils, and you saw them change so quickly in both directions, how did you end? I mean, we have the videos and we let's put that link in there again in the sidebar, but how did you end that exercise to teach them or unteach them what they had just manifested? The same way we could end this exercise that we have been using based on skin color in this country. I told them at the end of the day, boys and girls, I lied to you today. Blue eyed people aren't smarter at the end of the second day. I didn't tell that at the end of the first day. But at the end of the second day, I said, boys and girls, I lied to you yesterday on Friday and today. People of, with brown eyes are no better or worse than people with blue eyes. This exercise is over. And every one of those kids started to cry and so did I. And they all got together and hugged one another. Oh. And for the rest, I'm telling you, I have no idea how powerful it is to mm. force a person to see the truth and then to realize that there's a cure for it. There's a cure for racism. It's called ignorance. It's called seeing people as truly human beings, your cousins. It, I have a picture of those kids hugging one another because the, not those kids, but another group. The, the, uh, a friend of mine who's a professional photographer came in and filmed when that, that group got together, the second, third group that we did it with. And they just, they just want so much to get it back together. And the day after that exercise is over, a whole new attitude appears in a classroom. Kids would not allow other people. In fact, they wouldn't allow other teachers to be ignorant. They came mm -hmm. in from recess after that and said that and the, one of the other teachers, the other third grade teachers on the playground duty, on playground duty. And they said, and they were really upset. I said, what's going on here? That other teacher doesn't do anything when we do something wrong. She doesn't do a thing about it. But when that one group does something wrong, she really gets on them. She's be, she's discriminating against those kids. And somebody ought to tell her she's discriminating. I thought I had to say, uh, I'll talk to the principal. I'll see wow. what I can do. Because wow. those kids were, their eyes were open and they recognized it when they saw it. One of those, one of my third grade students' mothers came to me in the summer and said, I want to thank you for what you've done for my daughter. I said, what do I do for your daughter? She said, my mother-in-law, mothers-in-law, you know how they are. Every time she comes to the house, she uses the N-word. And I wish she would stop it. And now she has because my daughter walked up to her the last time she was in the house. And she said, Grandma, we don't use that word in our house. And if you're going to keep on using it, I'm going to go outside until you go home. Now, I didn't teach that kid much about respect for her elders. But I did teach her about elders that you can respect. Mm -hmm. And you can't respect elders after you learn the truth about race and racism. You can't do it. I remember when my sister was substituting at the junior high and the English teacher came down to the, down to the lunchroom and she was just to the teacher's lounge. And she was just furious. She said, I don't know what to do. And my sister said, what's going on? She said, well, I use the N word in the classroom. And one of those students said, we don't use that word in this school. And if you're going to keep on using it, I'm going to go out in the hall until you stop. She said to my sister, what would you have done? And my mother said, my sister said, well, I guess I'd quit using that particular word. Mm -hmm. That had never occurred to that so-called teacher. Mm -hmm. That woman is a teacher, not an educator. Right. Teachers train people. Educators mm -hmm. lead people out of ignorance. There's a huge difference. Mm. My sister was an educator. That English teacher was a teacher. So Jane, we have a question. We have many questions, but we have a very popular question from the audience. Could I ask that of you? Go ahead. Uh, so the question is from Amanda. Can you speak to the best practices families can do at home to raise children with equal respect for all? What can parents do to ensure their kids keep their minds and hearts open? Watch your mouth mm -hmm. and watch what you watch on television. Mm -hmm. We can create a society of human beings who appreciate people as they are if we stop watching things that dehumanize human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you have a, a, a legal system, 
that, that has to argue about punishing, greatly punishing somebody who is proud of having his knee on another person's neck mm -hmm. and holds it there for nine minutes mm -hmm. and the networks keep on showing it and showing it and showing it. What you have to do is contact the networks and say, you do it again, you show that again, and I'm going to cut you off my television set. Because yeah. you see, what keeps racism alive in this country is capitalism. And I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. But I do not believe in making money on the sorrow and the pain and the agony of other human beings because of our ignorance about other human beings. Amen. You have to Amen. change the way you behave in the, you have to change your language and the way you behave in your home. You have to talk about people as equal human, as human beings who, de who deserve and who promised, who are promised equitable treatment under the law. You have to stop saying, well, was it a black guy? And when people talk about a crime that has been committed, if they say it was done by a black man, you need to call that station and say, wait a minute. It's mm -hmm. time for you to stop that. It's time for us to watch out uh, Marshall McLuhan told us about the danger of television a long time ago. I would yeah. suggest that everybody get a book written by Marshall McLuhan and read it, and they'll realize why television could be a force for good. Instead, it is being used as a force for evil because people believe what they see. My father used to say to us, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Now, he would say, believe none of what you hear and none of what you see because I've been on television often enough to know what happens when they want that when when they ask you to be on a show and they tell you what they want you to say and mm -hmm. i have turned down lots of jobs because no i'm not going to say that you want me to tell the truth i'll tell the truth but you'll lose some sponsors so don't ask me to be on your show because i don't want you you need those sponsors and i don't need to be on your show that being on this show is not one of my needs you understand that no of course but, but i appreciate being asked to discuss this situation it's our in honor an honest manner in a yeah. up for, in an honest and upfront manner and i am not going to sugarcoat what is going on in this country as far as i'm concerned this is one of the finest countries on the earth it was until three and a half years ago yeah and most people worldwide admired and looked up to this country because we were trying to live trying we were working at living our principles we aren't yeah. anymore we aren't for the last three and a half years we haven't and we have been encouraged not to this is a dangerous time the first thing you can do is talk to your kids about voting and take them with you when you go to the polls every yeah. year so that they will see you okay. voting and then yeah. watch the polls and watch the results and then say that happened because not enough people went to the polls or that happened because a whole lot of people got angry and they aren't going to put up with this, this anymore you have to show your children examples of real citizenship. And I don't mean citizenship that says we'll go along to get along. I mm -hmm. mean citizenship of the Frederick Douglass type that mm -hmm. says, don't put up with that. You have the kids that were that were marching in every major city in the United States to, this weekend, this week, were doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. They are saying we will put a stop to this. And if you don't, if you don't put a stop to it, we will see to it that you are uncomfortable for the rest of your life in as as long as you're in that legal position, we'll see to it that you're uncomfortable and you will suffer. You won't suffer physically. We aren't going to hurt you physically. We're going to suffer. We're going to take our business away from Amazon. We're going to take our, I thought that I wrecked that. Well, we're, it's bad. You, need to say, you need to say, we're going to see to it that you suffer economically. That's what's happening in this country today. And we deserve to have that happen. Mm. A woman. A woman. <laughs> See, learning has taken place here. Exactly. Well, we are at at noon. Uh, Jane, thank you so much. You're a delight and you're incredibly scary and um, heartbreaking. And I'm so in love with you, frankly. I think everyone else here is. And it's not about you. It's about us waking up. So please listen to her words. Please listen to our African-American brothers and sisters. Please watch. Put that. Let's put that link for Jane's work in the sidebar yet again. Thank listen you. To listen to me. You need to have the experience in your life of not having to look down on other people because of your ignorance about skin color. You have no idea how happy, how wonderful this country could be if we could get over racism. And that's possible. Let's do it. A woman.
Thank you. Jane, thank you so much. Please keep it up and uh, you make TV or media worth watching. Seeing you on Oprah and Fallon is the highlight of my last week just watching you. Thank you. Do they you. like this hair? Oh, you're looking good. And I buttoned up. I'll keep it buttoned up. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank Take you. Thank yourself. you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it was fun. <laughs> okay. It was intense. It was scary. It was fun. <laughs> okay. I love the hair. Somebody's crazy. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off now. Yeah. My grandson is coming out for lunch. Goodbye. Aw. Have a good lunch. No soup sandwich.